Do you ever feel like you and a friend are speaking past each other? And she said, I wasn't criticizing. <laughs> or that you're not sure how to break out of a rut? I didn't know what to do at all. I lost a part of myself. I'm Shankar Vedantam, host of the podcast Hidden Brain. We explore questions that keep you up at night. I would go out in the backyard at 3 in the morning and scream my head off like a wild animal. And provide answers that are grounded in rigorous science. Because that is something that humans like a lot. Join us each week to explore your hidden brain. One in four older Americans, one in four, struggle to pay for prescription drugs. Since President Joe Biden signed the Inflation Reduction Act last fall, he has promised Americans that relief is on the way. Bringing down prescription drug costs doesn't just save seniors money. It cuts the federal deficit by billions of dollars. The law gives Medicare the power to negotiate prices directly with drug companies for the first time ever. And on September 1st, Medicare will announce its first targets, 10 of the country's costliest drugs. But what makes a drug price fair? For who? Consumers? Drug makers? Medicare has a tough job to do. They're going to try to figure out how to drive down the middle of that very difficult highway knowing that they're going to get shot at from both sides. Today, as Medicare blazes a new trail for prescription drug pricing in America, the stakes are high and the road ahead promises difficult choices. From the studio at the Leonard Davis Institute at the University of Pennsylvania, I'm Dan Gorenstein. This is Tradeoffs. We're joined by Tradeoff's senior producer, Leslie Walker, our team's go-to guide on wonky drug policy stories. Welcome back, Leslie. Thanks, Dan. Still waiting for some hazard pay for that last story on biosimilars, but I'll follow up with you about that later. <laughs> totally, dude. Check is in the mail. Uh-huh. <laughs> so look, Leslie, you are really here today because on September 1st, before Labor Day, Medicare is going to flex this power to start negotiating some prices directly with drug companies for the first time ever. Yeah, kind of wild, right? When you consider that Medicare is the drug industry's single biggest customer, spends some roughly $150 billion a year on meds for the program's 65 million beneficiaries. And they basically name their price for every other service they cover, doctor's visits, x-rays, surgeries, and yet they've never negotiated drug prices before. It's historic. So look, let's dig in uh, and we'll start by talking about what's really on the line here, Leslie. Why should we care what Medicare does or does not do at this negotiating table? Sure. So at its simplest here, Dan, there's two big things at stake, dollars and drugs. On the money front, Medicare already gets some discounts from drug makers, but this new power could save Medicare $100 billion by 2031, according to one federal report. And obviously, it should save patients some money, too. Now, now of course, money back in the pockets of one group generally means someone else is going to take a hit. And in this case, it's the pharmaceutical industry. That's right. And that's one big reason why several companies and trade groups have filed lawsuits to try to stop these negotiations. But we should also be clear here, Dan, that the law only lets Medicare negotiate drugs that have been on the market at least seven years and are among companies' top sellers. So these companies have generally already made billions of dollars on these products. Okay, so that's the dollars that are at stake. Great. You also said drugs are at stake. How does that work, Leslie? Yeah. So the question is whether this process will affect game-changing blockbuster drugs down the road. To break that down a bit more, by changing the rewards, the dollars available to drug makers, does Medicare also change the risks those companies are willing to take? The long-term effects of the kinds of innovation that you encourage, that is in some ways the biggest outcome of this law. That's health economist Darius Lakdawalla from the University of Southern California. He's saying Medicare has this chance to send a powerful signal, right, to the drug industry. Like, look, we're willing to pay more for so-called clinical home runs and less for the dribbles up the line, the bunts. 
Uh, to be clear here, Leslie, until now, Medicare has often paid top dollar for both the life-saving breakthroughs and the minor incremental improvements. You're saying, though, that this law gives Medicare a lot more bargaining power, which means now they can theoretically reward major innovators and ding the companies that are barely moving the needle. Yeah. Overnight, Dan, this new power is turning the tables on drug makers. Now, the industry, they're warning this could hurt them and people who are sick. Here's Lauren Nevis from the trade group Pharma, and Darius at USC sees it the same way too. We may not see the immediate impact of this on innovation tomorrow, but we are definitely going to see it for patients 10 years from now, 20 years from now. I worry that that long-term effect is not properly being considered and that future generations of patients do not have a seat at the table. The way the drug industry works, as you know, Dan, companies place bets today on molecules that may not come to market for years. One industry report projects over the next decade, because of Medicare's new negotiating power, we could see up to 139 fewer drugs. But but this is far from certain, right, Leslie? Like, everybody agrees this new role for Medicare will change innovation in some way, but just no one's sure how much. Exactly. On the other end, there's a federal report that says we'll lose just 15 drugs over the next 30 years. And some economists at Northwestern found any drugs we do lose, they're less likely to be these kind of big-time blockbusters we all want. So to recap, the tricky task ahead of Medicare is balancing these two big concerns, that the drugs that we have today are priced low enough that the patients who need them to live, to breathe, can actually afford them, and Medicare can too. But those prices also need to encourage companies to keep taking big swings. Yep, that's exactly the tension at the center of this all. Okay, so now that we know that we've got billions of dollars, generations of drugs, and life and death on the line, Leslie. No big deal. (laughs) Indeed, right, exactly. So let's dive into the negotiating process. Excellent, because I have got a treat for you, Dan. Tradeoff's very own game show. Two $1 million cases in play. The offer for you is $48,000. No suitcases full of cash, but... There will be drama. It's a huge change in the way that people will view the role of government in our healthcare system. It's going to have all kinds of ripple effects. That's Steve Pearson. He's the founder and president of ICER, the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review. This kind of think tank that's basically done for almost 20 years a version of what Medicare is about to do, develop a process for putting fair price tags on prescription drugs. So I challenge Steve with a kind of game show of my own. I'm calling it Going Up. Oh, God, Walker, seriously, dude? This is brutal. I know. But I said to Steve, look, pretend we're in an elevator. You've got 90 seconds to the top. How would you explain how Medicare is going to negotiate drug prices for the first time in history? That's a lot of pressure. I know. I was worried, too. But Steve, the guy didn't blink. I live in an elevator. What does that even mean? (laughs) (laughs) Everything I say is an elevator pitch. All right. So you're you're feeling confident then? Yes. All right. Elevator's going up, Steve. (laughs) All right. Here we go. All right. First, the government's not going to negotiate the price for every drug at any point in time. They're going to start with the top 10 highest cost drugs to Medicare that have been on the market for at least about a decade and which do not have competition from generics, they have to at least start with about a 25% discount off of the current price that's being paid by private insurers in the market. Then they, the government, is going to look at what other drugs are out there that can do the same thing. And are these drugs better or worse or about the same? They're going to throw all that into a blender and sit down with the drug company and say, okay, we think the best fair price is about 50% off. Now, the drug company, their draw is going to drop. The drug company gets one chance to come back with a formal counter offer. Then they can go back and forth negotiating for a few extra months. But at the end of the day, the government gets to say, this is our best and final offer. And if you don't like it, there's a stiff penalty to pay or you have to take your drug off the market. And that's it. 
And with 17 seconds to spare, Dan, Steve did it. He condensed a 200-page memo from Medicare, battled some truly horrible elevator music, and beat the clock. A stunning victory. Wow, Steve with the win. And what does he get? Uh, One very enthusiastic clapping emoji on Zoom. No corporate sponsors just yet for going up. I'm sure it's just a matter of time here, Walker. (laughs) I got to say, Leslie, I mean, Steve did, shockingly, make this process sound pretty straightforward. He did. I mean, he did kind of an amazing job. And I said the same thing to him. Like, come on, Steve. Is this really that simple? It sounds pretty straightforward, but almost every other word of what I just said There are still uncertainties about how it's actually going to work. Uncertainties, Dan? Like, how will Medicare quantify a drug's value? For who? And what metrics will they use? And those decisions could have a big effect on the savings that we see and the treatments that we get. We'll get into a couple of the tough choices Medicare is facing after the break. Tired of ads barging into your favorite news podcasts? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free news podcasts to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads. Welcome back. We're just a few weeks away from Medicare naming the first 10 drugs ever for price negotiations directly between the federal agency and drug makers. As you may expect with any new process, big questions remain about how this will all go down. Our senior producer, Leslie Walker, is here to explain those uncertainties and why they matter. Hey again, Leslie. Hey, Dan. Before the break, Steve Pearson laid this negotiation process out for us. Basically, Medicare compares a negotiated drug to similar treatments, then asks for a discount relative to the other options out there. They haggle a bit back and forth. The end. As Steve told us, though, this is not that simple. What are we missing? Fair question. And to understand the complexity here, Dan, it might help to think of this process like one of your favorite pastimes, a road trip. I do love The Open Road, a perfectly curated playlist, Leslie, and of course, a white castle somewhere along the way. Don't forget the Elliott Smith. (laughs) So look at it like this. Congress gave Medicare a clear destination, right? Lower drug prices. And in the law, they spell out a few specific places, some pit stops Medicare has to make along the way. But otherwise, Medicare can get to that final destination in almost an infinite number of ways. And as you know, as the king of road trips over there, Dan, you can have a pretty different trip depending on the roads you take. Totally. You could power through on the interstates or you could snake along a two-lane highway somewhere. Route 56, Leslie, in Kansas? Amazing. You get it, Dan. So... As Ben Rome, a Harvard Health Policy researcher, laid out, the first decision Medicare has to make is this. Which other treatments will they compare each of these negotiated drugs to? If you say a drug works really well, you have to say works really well compared to what? How much added value does it offer over what's already out there? I asked Ben, who's also a doctor, to give us a specific example. Like, what's so hard about identifying other drugs that treat the same disease? He brought up this one that helps stop blood clots and strokes. It's called Eliquis. Oh, Eliquis. Yeah, my mom's on that, I think, for her AFib. Right. Atrial fibrillation, if you want to be formal. That's totally possible and would make sense. Eliquis is prescribed to about 3 million people on Medicare. The agency spent more on Eliquis in 2021 than any other retail drug. About 12 billion bucks, not including some discounts. And for patients, Dan, the drug can cost anywhere from 40 to $500 a month. Sounds like a good candidate for Medicare's negotiation list. That's the word on the street anyway, and it's at least curious that Eliquis's manufacturer, Bristol Myers Squibb, filed one of the first lawsuits to stop these negotiations. Anyway, when it comes to deciding which other drugs to compare Eliquis to, Medicare has basically two roads they could take. They could just compare it to three other drugs that work in similar ways, all newer, fancier blood thinners, all priced north of 100 bucks a month. Or... Ben Rome says they could throw this fourth drug in the mix, 
a little pill called warfarin. Warfarin has been around for decades, and it is extraordinarily inexpensive. We're talking like four bucks a month at Walmart here. And it treats the same condition? It does. But for some patients, it's not as effective at stopping blood clots, can have more dangerous side effects like brain bleeding. The way Congress wrote this law, Dan, they instructed Medicare to compare these negotiated drugs, like Eliquis, to, quote, therapeutic alternatives, but left it up to Medicare to define that term. So a tough question could be, is warfarin a legitimate alternative? The idea of including warfarin really implies that it's totally interchangeable. And I think many doctors, including many cardiologists and specialists, you know, wouldn't necessarily be comfortable, for example, flipping a coin and assigning the patient based on that. All that being said, Ben Rome absolutely thinks Medicare should include warfarin in the mix because it offers this kind of baseline. Right. It's like if we were shopping for a car for our hypothetical road trip, knowing what the Kia costs help us decide if we want to splurge for that vintage 1988 navy blue Volvo 240 wagon. Is it really worth the upgrade? Exactly. So Bristol Myers Squibb, who makes Eliquis, saw their product as an alternative to Warfarin. Get this, Dan. The company literally marketed Eliquis by promising it's better than Warfarin. So if there's a better treatment than warfarin, I'll go after that. Eliquis. Eliquis reduces stroke risk better than warfarin and has less major bleeding than warfarin. Eliquis has both. Don't stop taking Eliquis without talking to your doctor. Okay, Leslie. So let's say Medicare does include warfarin in the mix. The next big decision is slapping a price on it, right? Totally. It's gut check time for Medicare, where they got to actually put a dollar amount on how much more they value what Eliquis offers patients compared to warfarin. Is it worth five times more? Ten times? Right now, Medicare pays about 40 times more per dose of Eliquis than warfarin. And just to remind folks of our stakes here, Medicare's answer to that question could cut a life-saving drug's price by half, two-thirds, maybe more. At the same time, that price cut will also send a signal to other companies considering whether to develop safer, better alternatives to old therapies like warfarin, asking themselves, is that investment worth it? That's right, Dan. And here's where Medicare's road trip can really start to branch in like a thousand different directions. When you think about the value of a car, you're thinking about safety, you're thinking about speed, you're thinking about fuel economy. In the same way, you know, health is just more than length of life and quality of life, right? University of Texas researcher Anton Avancenia is saying there are so many factors Medicare could consider here, right? Does the drug help people skip fewer days of work? depend less on a caregiver, and some might matter more to one patient than another. Then there's an entire list Congress told Medicare they have to at least consider. How much has the federal government supported the drug's discovery? The cost of producing and distributing that drug. What the drug company says that they spent to develop the drug. Whether the manufacturers have been able to... If it were me, I'd just choose the road with the most white castles on it. You know, double jalapeno cheeseburgers or bus, Leslie Walker. But then you'd also need to choose the road with the most bathrooms on it, Dan. So as you can see, all these roads require some complex calculations. I see what you're saying. Okay. All right. So when it comes to how Medicare is going to measure and weigh all these different inputs they have to consider, they have published some details on the data they plan to collect. And in many cases, Ben Rome says they're going to be overwhelmed by what they find. These drugs have been on the market for a long time, so that has generated a lot of new evidence about their safety and effectiveness. But in other cases, the government may face some gaping holes in the data. You know, actual head-to-head comparative trials might not be available between Eliquis and some of the other drugs in the same class. And that's going to be a, a problem for Medicare when it goes to actually assess these products. Uh, okay, Leslie. So once Medicare wades through these piles of data, somehow boils them down into a single price, I assume they offer that to the company. What happens next? So then the company gets to counteroffer and the real negotiations begin. At least in theory. One big unknown here, Dan, is just how much of a good faith kind of back and forth that will be. And once that all ends, there's one other big decision for Medicare to make. How will they apply the process they just used for, let's say, Eliquis to all the other drugs they need to negotiate? Right, because these first 10 drugs, they're not the last drugs Medicare is going to negotiate, right? 
Yeah, the law says Medicare's got to negotiate as many as 15 more the next year, 15 more the year after that, and another 20 after that. And I mean, obviously, Leslie, we're not the first country to attempt this sort of process. No, we are, in fact, extraordinarily late to the government price negotiation party. So when it comes to figuring out how a single process works for all these different drugs, is there anything the U.S. can borrow from other countries who do this, some kind of roadmap? Yeah, I mean, we could do a whole episode on all the fascinating ways other countries do this work. The problem is they tend to use very formulaic, very quantitative approaches. And at least so far, Medicare has said publicly they plan to start with a qualitative approach. No explicit formula, lots of flexibility. I asked the agency's director, Mina Seishamani, more about that. And here's what she said. We absolutely plan on using data and analyses as part of the process. Where we come to the conversation about qualitative is how you then bring all of those data points together when you are engaging in a back and forth negotiation process. You have to maintain flexibility to be able to consider the nuanced differences between different drugs. Okay, Leslie, what Mina's saying makes sense to me. Like, you might have a route plan for your road trip, but sometimes you have to audible. So Medicare might take one approach with Eliquis. Maybe they weigh those bleeding risks extra carefully or something. But for the next drug they negotiate, maybe it's a cancer drug, and Medicare focuses on how many extra days it adds to someone's life. That's right. And and some folks I talk to think that flexibility is a good thing for Medicare, especially as it gets its kind of sea legs doing this work. But the flip side of flexibility, at least if you're the drug industry here, is unpredictability. Right. And so you're saying an unpredictable process is essentially bad for business, makes it hard for companies and investors to know where to put their money. Exactly. And and I thought Darius Lakdawalla summed up the tension for Medicare here pretty well. If they just had a quantitative method and they said, we're going to calculate value this way, it will definitely be imperfect. But the question is whether that's better than a process that nobody can predict, even if it is a really sophisticated, fantastic way of measuring value to patients. Because what good is it if companies can't rely on that being true when their drug comes to market? And for people, Dan, who don't lose sleep over those billion-dollar companies and how best to spend their money, experts like Ben Rome and Steve Pearson told me more consistency could help this whole process be more credible, less vulnerable to political pressure, potentially a blueprint for employers and private insurers who are fighting the same fight. So, Leslie, just starting to wrap up here. We're watching this major government agency stand up a brand new team of economists, analysts, pharmacists, data scientists, pour all this time and effort into grappling more publicly, more directly than we've ever seen with this kind of foundational question that honestly has dogged us for decades. What is a fair price to pay for prescription drugs? Yeah, and as with all difficult questions, Dan, there's no easy or obvious answer here. Depending on who you are, what you value, you could come to a very different conclusion about what's fair. But here's the thing. Even if Medicare hits some bumps in the road, as Steve Pearson says, it's already a win that the agency is finally grappling with this tension between making drugs affordable and encouraging innovation. And they're doing it out in the open for the entire country to see. Anytime that government starts a new mechanism or a new process, it may not live up to everybody's hopes and expectations. But there's also hope that they can learn and engage the American public in a dialogue around value and pricing that will expand way beyond drugs and make these kinds of trade-offs more transparent so that we can make decisions around pricing, value, and access that try to get the balance right going forward. Leslie, thank you for all of your great work on this story. One, we will keep following, and there will be an additional check in the mail, too. You can count on that. <laughs> You're welcome, Dan. Medicare will make its first price offers to companies next February, and negotiations will continue through August. The agency will then publish the final prices next September, and they will take effect in 2026. I'm Dan Gorenstein. This is Tradeoffs. Offs. 
Lisa Fitzpatrick spent 20 years working in some of the most prestigious jobs in health policy. But a few years ago, she walked away to go after a foundational but often invisible problem. People feeling disconnected, people feeling unheard, people being confused by health information or being fearful of things they don't know. One doctor's crusade to help more people understand their own health care and why insurers are starting to buy in. Next time on Tradeoffs. If you enjoyed today's episode of Tradeoffs, don't keep it to yourself. Tell someone else about it. Friend, colleague, family member. Better still, leave a rating or a review wherever you subscribe to us. Apple Podcasts, NPR One, Spotify, anywhere. The Tradeoffs team is producers Ryan Levy and Alex Olgan, editors Kate Cahan and Deborah Franklin, executive director Jessica Silverman, audience engagement lead Shannon Crane, research reporter Soleil Shah, production engineer Cedric Wilson, sound designer Andrew Perella, executive editor Dan Gorenstein, and senior producer Leslie Walker. The Tradeoffs theme song was composed by Ty Sitterman with additional music this episode from Blue Dot Sessions and Epidemic Sound. Tradeoffs coverage of healthcare costs is supported in part by Arnold Ventures and West Health. Special thanks this week to Jeremy Balric, Zach Barron, Anirban Basu, Stacy Dusitsina, Inma Hernandez, Ben Ippolito, Matt Martin, Leah Rand, and Rakaya Yearby. Thanks also to all our listeners who helped to support our work, including Kristen McCarthy, Kate Baker, and Vivian Ho. Our media partner is SideFX Public Media, based at WFYI. Tradeoffs is supported by the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, Arnold Ventures, West Health, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, the Scan Foundation, the Sozose Foundation, the Leonard Davis Institute of Health Economics at the University of Pennsylvania, California Healthcare Foundation, and the National Institute for Healthcare Management Foundation. The views expressed in this episode are those of the individuals and not those of Tradeoff staff, advisors, or funders. Tired of ads barging into your favorite news podcasts? Good news. Ad-free listening on Amazon Music is included with your Prime membership. Just head to amazon.com slash ad-free news podcast to catch up on the latest episodes without the ads. Enjoy thousands of ACAST shows ad-free for Prime subscribers. Some shows may have ads.